Welcome to the Talent Empowerment Podcast, where we share stories of successful humans so you can lift up your own organizations, your teams, and your community. I am your humble host, Tom Finn, and on the show today, we have a British Mensa member who was born in Namibia and grew up in South Africa. He goes by Mike Mulvey. Mike, thrilled to have you on the show. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Great to, great to be here. Well, we are thrilled to have you on the show. And for those of you listening, if you don't know what a Mensa is, uh, it is a group that provides a space for like minds to socialize, stretch themselves intellectually, and engage in interesting activities. Uh, the Mensa family comprises over 140,000 folks across more than 100 countries across the world. And we will ask Mike all about the details of this amazing society. Uh, and while that is a part of Mike's life, uh, he is actually an architect by trade and joined HED Design in 2018. He's got a long history of success before that. And he focuses on laboratory design for life science companies. So essentially, he's designing the structure for smart people to design the next exciting discoveries in human science for all of us. And before we get to that, let's back up. How does one become a member of Mensa, Mike? Well, way back then, kind of a half off sales, I got in for half the normal IQ requirement. But you know, in, in reality, especially in the UK, as most things are there, it's a drinking club. We used to meet in the pubs, talk about football, soccer, rugby, you know, all those things, uh, politics, of course, and occasionally some intellectual stuff, but that was just really a total aside. But it was a, it was a good way. When I first got to the UK after leaving South Africa, it was a great way to socialize and meet new people and um, talk nonsense. Well, uh, the website does not say drinking club and uh, uh, talking football in the pub. It says the only qualification for membership as it is today is a score within the top 2% of the general population with an approved intelligence test and that the name Mensa was chosen because it means table in Latin and represents the idea that all members of the society sit as equals around a table regardless of racial, religious, political, or socioeconomic uh, distinctions, which I think is absolutely fabulous. Yeah, that's very true. I mean, I've been, the other thing is, as I've traveled, and I've traveled all over the world, um, lived and worked on four continents, probably in 20 different countries, I've often met other Mensa members from all cultures, religions, races, nationalities, etc. And it's been a great leveler, great way to introduce each other and get to know each other and just talk freely. Well, you, you know, mentioned things, you, you mentioned that you grew up in South Africa. Uh, was this a part of your plan when you were growing up? What was the plan when you were growing well, it up? Was, you know, growing up in South Africa, it was during the days of apartheid. Uh, the south of South Africa, Cape Town, where I grew up, is analogous to San Francisco. It's the liberal part of the country. Uh, we never wanted any part of apartheid. It was forced on us by the people up north when they took over the, the country back in, I think, 1949 or something. Um, so I just never felt I could survive long term there because when, when, I, when, when I left the country in 1988, Mandela was still in jail. There didn't seem to be any hope of him ever being released, no future there. And I figured if I was going to come out, have, have, have children one day, I didn't want to bring them up in that, that society. So leaving South Africa was kind of in the back of my mind almost from day one. It's a beautiful country, fantastic people, but politically and economically, it's, it's still has a lot of challenges. Yeah, understood. So you're in South Africa, you're thinking of a, a better place, a better life for yourself, and you end up in the UK. Did you always want to be an architect? Um, no, I started a college in medical school. In, in those days, you went straight from high school into medical school. Um, it's kind of scary to think about because had I carried on that track, I would have been a fully qualified MD at the age of about 22 or 23. And knowing the hooligan I was at 22 or 23, compared to the hooligan I am now, a little bit older than that, it would have been dangerous. I probably would have killed people. But one night I walked into the architectural school. I was actually acting as photographic editor for the campus newspaper. And I walked into the architectural school late at night to cover a story of some sort. And it was Party City. The wine was flowing, the music was blaring, good old rock and roll. And I thought, gee, here's medical school, years of hard work, uh, studying, studying facts and figures. Here's architectural school. It's Party City. Also a six-year course there, but still. So I switched majors, much to my father's disgust. Uh, but I did, you know, I didn't just do it randomly. I did have a talent, I think, for design and spatial recognition and things like that. Uh, so graduated from there. 
and took the opportunity to move to the UK. Um, back in those days, South Africa was still sanctioned and pretty much a pariah around the world. But the UK, I had British citizenship thanks to my, my father. So it was a fairly easy segue for me. Worked in London for mm, quite a year and a half, two years. And the office there um, offered for me to go out and run their office in the Middle East, in the Sultan of Oman. Now, London's an interesting place. It's a great place to visit. My office was in the same complex as Westminster Abbey. I could walk across Westminster Bridge every morning on the way to work. It was walking through a thousand years of Western civilization. But after the first week or two, the rain, the sleet, and the rest of it, it's just the way to work. So when they offered me this position in the Middle East, I grabbed it with both hands. Had an incredible experience in Muscat in the Sultanate. Got to do things like drive a um, Ferrari that belonged to the bodyguard of the Sultan through the desert at about 300 kilometers an hour. Um, you know, a sail on Arab Dars, scuba dive on the coast there, and do some architecture in between. But thanks to my background in medicine, which was involved a lot of biotechnology and chemistry, etc., I've always had this interest in lab design. So I tend to gravitate towards that. Um, when my contract was over in the Middle East, I thought of going back to London, but not really enjoying the place. My wife at the time was interested in doing a course in gemology, so we came across to LA so she could study. And I found a job there, and um, the rest is pretty much history. I've been in the U.S. now for, I think, 37 years. And um, in 1990, I met up with a guy, Ken Kornberg, who at that time, he and Earl Walls, I think, were the only two specialist lab architects in the country, or one of the, the very few anyway. And I uh, worked with him for 24, 25 years, uh, became a principal in charge of the San Diego office eventually. But the thing about Ken Kornberg is that very, very involved in science. His entire family are scientists. Uh, his father and his brother are both Nobel Prize winners. So they've steeped it. He, he's kind of the black sheep of the family, not being a scientist. But again, he is focused on the science. And the thing about designing lab buildings is we're working with very sophisticated, highly educated people. Uh, to put them in the, in the machine, so to speak, I think is, is a mistake because these are the people that you want to create your next cure for cancer, your next wonder drug, your vaccines, the, the stuff we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So the way we designed our labs was very much centered around the people. We, we would use color, we would use textures. Uh, we were one of the first firms to really emphasize the use of wood for lab casework. Now, a lot of people said, well, why wood compared to stainless steel or phenolics? The thing is wood with a decent sealant, is just as sanitary, it's just as, um, safe to, to use, obviously not in clean rooms, but certainly in general lab areas. And wood is something I think most people, we, we react to, we, we resonate with, it's, it's a natural substance. So using wood, using colors, and going back to color, you know, it's an interesting thing that I, I, go, I go crazy in Southern California, where we have what a friend of mine used to call condomania, where everything is beige, Navajo white, kind of bleh color. And yet we travel to the Mediterranean and people come back raving about the beautiful colors on the Algarve coast on, you know, in, in the Ita Italian um, Riviera, etc. And yet we come back home to our beige boxes. So in labs, to paint a wall, a bright blue, for instance, maybe it's the company logo, maybe it's got something to do with the research, whatever it may be, it just brightens up the space, takes the accent a little bit away from the, the mechanics. Because otherwise, a lab is very much a machine that people are living inside very heavy on the HVAC, very heavy on the piping. You know, you're going to a GMP facility where they manufacture drugs, for instance, and it's, it's like work inside the boiler room almost. So to bring in some colors, play with light, make it interesting, it's going to encourage your people to work longer hours, to be happier there, um, to be more creative. The other thing that's important in lab design, it goes back to, I think, Cambridge University, where they found an amazing number of breakthrough discoveries and what they got it down to in the end was the old buildings tended to lead people to interact more often. They'd run into each other in the stairwells, which were very generously spaced. They'd just talk randomly about different things, and people from different disciplines would cross-fertilize. Sometimes, in, one thing I was taught, I was taught by a bunch of crazy Jesuit priests back in South Africa, and the two things that they taught me was to think way outside the box, and secondly, to question everything, to have an open mind. In fact, one of the sayings they um, liked to tell us was, their goal was not to educate us, but to open our minds so that when we left school, high school, we'd be receptive and our minds would be open to learn when we joined the real world. So um, 
again, you know, we, we've got to be creative in, in, in things like that. Mike, that was a, a great overview of sort of where you started and 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 how things have matriculated along along your journey, and it has been uh, really an incredible journey. So as we as we sort of unpack some of these components here, you you went to the UK, you went to the Middle East, uh, and and then you made it over to the US. And so all of all of this. What, what did you learn through moving from multiple places? Did you did you meet different people? What oh, yeah. what was really the lesson learned from from being so? Well, the lesson I learned, and you know, obviously I was pretty receptive. Thanks again to those those Jesuits, and thanks to growing up in a pretty crazy society in South Africa at the time, it was the high, the heyday of apartheid, and you know, I got out as fast as I could. But I met people from different cultures in the Middle East. I met friends who would look after me, um, help me when necessary. Until fairly recently, they still send me Christmas cards. I would send them cards for their festivals. And, I, you know, it's, it's a cliche, but I've discovered that people are people. Um, in fact, it's, it's amused, always amused me that back in South Africa when I was there, the big bogeyman were the communists. The Russians, they were going to take over the world. They were going to take over Africa. They were just marching down. And any day now, we'd all be forced at gunpoint back into the sea. And I thought to myself, even in high school, I'm sure your average person in Moscow doesn't want to take over the world. He or she just wants to get home in one piece, feed their family, make it through the next week, the next day, whatever it may be. And I remember reading a book, I think it was by Arthur C. Clarke many years ago, many, many years ago, in fact, uh, where every person, as a sub, sub thing in the book, uh, had a, a computer terminal through which they could speak to anybody in the world. And that way, when politicians did stupid things, he would call up Ivan in Moscow and say, hey, Ivan, what's going on? Are you guys really want to take over the world? Really want to nuke us all? And it's amazing that, I mean, Clark was obviously a visionary, a fairly well-established science fiction writer. He obviously was talking about the internet, which we do today, where we can FaceTime people from anywhere in the world. And I think it's becoming harder and harder for politicians to drum up fear of the unknown people, um, which is where politicians, politicians traditionally have got their, their power from. So it's an exciting time to live in where we can communicate globally. The other feeling I've had for a long time is that we probably have the answer to a lot of the big problems we face the cure for cancer, different diseases, um, social illnesses, etc. But it's distributed across the world. And the only way in the past people could interact would be going to conferences, clubs, things like that, men's meetings maybe. But now we can talk to each other through the internet and maybe a physicist in San Diego can communicate with a organic chemist in Strasbourg in France with a, another guy in, in Japan somewhere. And say, hey, you know, that's a good idea. Let's try it in my field. And in fact, one of the Big projects I worked with it was Kornberg, part of the flagship project was the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, OIST. It's been an incredibly successful campus with a long, there's a long, difficult history to get it built. But on this campus, there are no, within reasonable practical limits, no departmental boundaries. You may actually have a physicist sitting side by side with a chemist, with a biotechnology person, etc. And the whole idea is that these people will talk to each other, they'll sit down, have coffee with each other, and Sometimes just a spark of an idea comes out of left field from a different discipline and will germinate into something that's really meaningful. Yeah, that's 100% uh, right in any business. Uh, anytime we get uh, folks with different disciplines sitting down together and really communicating well and effectively, what you tend to find is new ideas sprout, uh, good ideas that are collective in nature and think about inclusivity and try to create products and services that that are really thoughtful about a global audience. And I love when we have those types of conversations, whether it's in the science community or in any other business community around the world, I think it's important that we're looking at things from a global perspective and you hit the nail on the head. It's, uh, it's people getting together from different disciplines and really understanding how to build something new and unique for the betterment of humankind. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's, it kind of goes against what I said about making the lab as comfortable a place as possible for people to work in. But at the same time, we need to get people out of the lab and into common areas. And, you know, I remember working on the Pfizer campus here in La Jolla, where we designed little alcoves along the hallways um, with a, a, a freestanding sheet of glass, for instance, as a market board, a couple of easy chairs, maybe a coffee machine. Two people walking by and say, you know, hey, Joe, what do you think about this new way to sequence DNA or whatever it may be? and pick up a thing and start brainstorming right then and there. And that's where the, the sparks are ignited to create those discoveries. 
Yeah, so let's go there. Uh, you're an architect by nature. You work in the life sciences, biocom, biotech kind of space, um, and you build things so that people can go in and build things, uh, for lack of a better term. And this is really important work, primarily because these are the folks that are designing the future of uh, support for, for humankind. So as you think about space, as you think about human interaction, as you think about how to put people together, is there a is there a game plan that you have for every facility you build, or is is it different by uh, by facility by company? You know, every program is different. Every research direction is somewhat different. Um, yes, there are certain components that are fairly standard. Um, you know, almost every discipline has a lab bench. What happens on that bench may be different for obviously a chemist or a biologist or a physicist, but that is kind of standard. But once you leave that, there are some big differences. Uh, one of my great loves in life is uh, doing puzzles, finding solutions to difficult projects, especially in, in the three-dimensional world. I remember at school, a friend of mine had some of those Chinese uh, puzzles. They come as a, a wooden sphere. And you press a certain part, a piece pops out, and the whole idea is to put these pieces back together again when the thing's disassembled. And putting together a research program is very much like that. Uh, just recently, I was asked to design a, um, a 15,000 square foot um, rodent vivarium clean dirty circulation in the basement of a new building. Uh, I was given the basement profile, the number of uh, procedure rooms, holding rooms, etc. And um, getting that puzzle together, still having it practical, constructible on some kind of halfway reasonable budget, and, and, and at the end of the day work for the research program. It's a great challenge. And I just can't research ch challenges, you know, um, Physically, mentally, almost in any, any event, anyway, I still run um, obstacle courses. I did recently the Marine Corps Boot Camp Challenge, just because I'm, I'm just too stubborn to ever lie down and play dead. But secondly, give me a challenge. It's very hard to resist. And design can be very much that. I don't like the idea of a standard solution. In fact, it's interesting that in the US, I think it's happening worldwide as well, firms are much more specialized than they were, for instance, in the UK. When I was working in the UK, I worked for... Um, a company called Triad, and then before that, Fitzroy Robinson and Partners. And one day we'd be designing a hotel, the next day a shopping center, the third day maybe a small lab somewhere or a school. And it, the good thing with that is each time we approached those projects, we had an open mind, no preconceptions. In the U.S., clients will go to a lab architect. In fact, a very much a specialized lab architect. If you want a clean room, a GMP facility, you go to somebody that's just done, hopefully, put down pencils on the identical project last week so they learned all the expensive lessons on somebody else's dime and can give you the new improved version. But that way you do tend to get formal, formula solutions, which yeah, I guess they're economical, but at the same time, they can be very uh, unimaginative. And what are the biggest wastes of time that you see people take on in this space? Are, are people wasting time in the science space? Are they are they doing projects or taking on um, different components of their day that waste time? Or are these pretty efficient folks? I think they're fairly efficient. I mean, they're expensive folks. They, you know, they usually paid pretty decent income, but the facilities are expensive. It's interesting that I worked on a project uh, for the Cleveland Clinic, new ice, ice center. They had just hired a top, top, top superstar ophthalmic, ophthalmic surgeon, excuse me. And some of the people they told me, it was like an NFL negotiation for a star, star player. This guy was coming in and they designed the facility run. So they're going to want that facility to be as efficient, as productive, as special as possible. Um, the waste of time, I don't know, maybe waste of materials. Very often you walk into a lab and you'll see several fumes standing there with experiments set up that haven't been touched in several years. And, um, you know, they were set up, they're done. The people moved on, maybe went somewhere else. Nobody got around to dismantling the thing. There's another fume put nearby, they didn't need it. And it's, when, when I was working on the Pfizer campus, well, it started out as a campus for Agron Pharmaceuticals that eventually got bought by Pfizer. But their COO, Glenn Zinzer, he was quite uh, dictatorial in a way. He would, if people wanted equipment, they had to justify it. And he said, look, typically one scientist, one hood, period, no more than that. Um, because sometimes when you go to a lab on a new project and you uh, start doing the initial programming, you ask the users, Okay, what do you need in this lab? What, what's your equipment? What's your functions? And they'll give you three lists. There'll be the, the needs list, the want list, and the wish list. It'll all come in one list, but you've got to distill out from that list. 
where these three lists start, each one starts, each one ends. And obviously you give them the needs, hopefully some of the wants, and the wishes, well, if the budget can stand it at the end, yes, maybe. But you've got to realize some of those are just wishes that they would have if everything else, if they won the lottery, for instance. It was also interesting, a few years back, uh, we had a competition to um, redevelop, um, uh, my brain has just flipped out here, a lab in Paris that was probably 200 years old. You take a current scientist and you give him this lab and say, look, this is the, the, the lab where penicillin was developed, make it work. And you'll make it work, or she'll make it work. But if you take the same person, give them a blank sheet of paper and a brand new building, tell them what they want, and they'll have a huge shopping list of requirements, things they need. But again, they're creative people, they're intelligent people, they can work around things. The secret is to, as I say, stimulate them, give them what they need, and then let them know to do what they need to do. So Mike, does that make architecture a luxury? I mean, this feels like a luxury item now in your Paris we, example. You know, unfortunately, architecture to some extent is a luxury. It was interesting when I switched from medicine to architecture, um, a girlfriend of mine's father, who was a very successful architect, took me aside one time and said, look, you know, think about the switch from medicine because we will always need doctors. When you're sick, you don't want to negotiate the price for the surgeon is the best for doing your heart operation. When you're in trouble, you want the best lawyer in town. As architects, we're a luxury item in that people come to us when they have extra money to spend when they want to build something. It's very rarely an absolute mission critical need. Uh, and the problem with that, of course, is when the economy slows down even slightly, we're amongst the first people out in the streets because it's always easy to uh, postpone a project, downscale it, value engineer it, um, you know, whatever, or cancel the whole darn thing. Whereas if you need heart surgery, boy, you're going to find a way to pay for it, find a way to make it happen. Yeah, you bet. But, if you if yeah. you need heart surgery, you're going to find the best, the best mm -hmm. surgeon and price is really no... Uh, no problem or no object for, for many at that, at that point. Yeah. That's why we have health insurance in the United States uh, so that people can get those, uh, those procedures covered uh, certainly at some, at some level. Uh, so when you, when you think about design spaces that people really want to be in and you're getting your creative juices flowing, you've got that blank sheet of paper. Maybe you've got the lists of needs, wants, and wishes. Uh, where do you start? You know, that's a good question. I remember the college I went to was very design oriented. We have these design charrettes that um, were brutal. They give you an almost impossible problem and expect you to solve it in two or three days or something. My solution was always to read up on all the information I could find on the program, on the details, maybe the building footprint if there was one, and then go away. And the, subconsciously, I think one's brain carries on calculating, manipulating, looking at the data. And sometimes I'd wake up the next morning and half the design would just intuitively come to me. It's, I, I can't describe it. I think it's something, uh, when I was at school, as I said, it, it was a six year program. And I remember in our second or third year, um, we did a bit of a cross thing where some of the second years would work with the first year, some of the third years would work with the six year students. And people would come back and say, wow, those people really think differently. Because again, through doing all these design charrettes over and over and over again, um, we were trained to think outside the box, to find solutions, to visualize things. Um, somebody's just talent, somebody you can learn. Um, you know, I, th I think there, there's many ways to design buildings. You can do it, just follow the program, work purely me me mechanically, methodically. But if you want a building that has a little bit of a soul, a building that's going to inspire people, as I said earlier, to make people want to work longer hours, stay there later at night, make that great discovery. It needs that little bit extra. Um, you know, if you go back to the not the founder, but one of the big uh, stars of the modern movement, uh, Le Corbusier, back in France, way back. Um, you know, there were um, proportions he used, the golden mean, um, things like that. Um, dimensions that, that are somehow intuitively pleasing to people. And there's a, there's a lot of science and mathematics behind it. Math is my favorite subject outside of architecture and, and just being a general geek. But, you know, it's, it's interesting looking in the math that involves music. There's a great book, Gordel Escher Bach, The Golden Braid, which compares the art of Maurice Escher, the mathematics of Gordel, and the music of Johann Sebastian Bach. And it's amazing how much there's an overlap between those things. And I think math can translate into dimensions, into spaces, um, you know, into proportions of rooms, um, things like that, which again will inspire people. So you can have a lab that is very, um, Utilitarian, it'll maybe work perfectly for all the HVAC, all the different services, the gases, 
liquids, etc. But the people just won't be happy there. Take similar situation, bring in some color, some careful uh, attention to the movement patterns, the way people work in the space, the textures, um, and suddenly that lab will be more productive. People stick around longer. In fact, with Kornberg, we did a study of the life cycle cost of a build to suit uh, research building over 30 years, obviously for an owner occupier, not a, um, a developer TI situation. And over 30 years, the total cost, it was up in the part of the billions, but 95% plus was people. The remaining 5% was the actual cost of the initial building, the fees, the permits, all that good stuff that people worry about in the beginning. But the people were 95% of the cost over the 30 years. Now, if you try to optimize anything, any process, any thing that happens, you look at the biggest numbers. And if you can improve them by 5%, say, you're going to get a big return for your buck. If you take a tiny number, improve that by 5%, you're not going to get much back. So sometimes in the beginning of a project, we are faced with um, budget constraints, people trying to really squeeze, you know, five pounds out of a three pound bag kind of thing. Um, sometimes that's, that's false economy. I'm obviously you've got to work with the money you have and the, the, the um, resources you have, but you, you need to think long term and to think about the process and what, what's going to come out at the end of the day, not so much the initial return. And that, to that, we'll see a big difference between labs built for developers and labs built for owner users. Like recently in San Diego, we had J. Craig Fenter, not so recently now, but anyway, built his research after he did the DNA se sequencing. There you've got a lab designed for a person. Another great example is the Salk Institute. I mean, Jonas Salk made all the money from the polio vaccine and built that icon to architecture, to research, that is just a, a Taj Mahal for architects around the world. <laughs> Again, but with very, very long-term goals. That building has full interstitials. I did a building in Cleveland for the Cleveland Clinic where above the ceiling is a fully walkable floor between the floors where the uh, mechanical um, service people can get in there, they can move things around, they can resurface things, uh, change stuff without disturbing the research that goes on below. There's a big cost involved, obviously. You've got to, instead of just having a regular lay-in lightweight ceiling, is a fully walkable um uh, gantry ways and things like that. But in the 30, 40 years of the, the clinic, maybe longer, we'll use that building. It'll pay back many, many times over. And out of all of these projects, you've probably done quite a few. How many projects have you done, Mike? You know, I've never added them all up, but probably several hundred. Several and they hundred. range from, you know, one room lab renovations to that a project in Okinawa, which is probably whew, several million square feet. It's the, the, pro the project costs it's in the billions. And do you have a favorite or a top uh, the, three? The Okinawa project is number one favorite. Um, that one, there was a long, tortuous process to get it built in the first place because um, the Japanese wanted it to be an open place for creativity, for new thoughts. The Japanese are, it's, it's kind of judgmental, I guess, but traditionally they're not known for new ideas, but for perfecting and developing other people's ideas. So what they wanted was a center of excellence reasonably far away from Tokyo, so it wouldn't be too under the thumb of the Ministry of Education. Okinawa was suffering at the time because the Marines had pulled out and the economy needed a bit of a boost. And so we found this land. It was an interesting piece of land, very sensitive, so we had to be careful how we designed the project. It's been a long time working out how to, how to site the buildings. And um, what we came up with at the end was placing the buildings on the fingers, the ridges that led down to the sea, the canyons between them were very, very sensitive, so we left them alone. The buildings were built largely out of local stone, uh, built to emulate Okinawan traditional hillside castles, uh, stone, wood textures, a lot of just beautiful Japanese woodwork, for instance. Connections between the buildings were free-spanning bridges. In fact, we retroactively applied for LEED certification and were awarded LEED Silver, which I think is the first time ever in Japan, because when we started the design, the client didn't want lead, but thanks to the uh, very, very fastidious way the contractor documented everything and just our general good um, um, habits of, of designing um, environmentally from California and from the U.S. Infessor, we were able to get that lead certification retroactively. After that, I think probably the Pfizer campus. Uh, that was an interesting situation where it started for Agron Pharmaceuticals with a, um, a landlord, developer, and then um, Agron coming in as the tenant. So there were different uh, agendas at play there. 
Pfizer bought Agron halfway through and bought the campus out. But the whole thing is very modular. And the nice thing there is we have a lab module that is relatively easily converted from chemistry to biology to robotics to whatever you need. And that campus, it's close to about 800,000 square feet of lab space, has been modified, renovated, changed many, many times since we completed it. It was also a challenge in that it comes under the Coastal Commission, so we had very strict height limits. Uh, we couldn't have huge exhaust stacks on the roof, for instance. And uh, lots of challenges, but I think the final solution was pretty amazing. Uh, third after that, boy, um, there's a little building in um, University Town Center in San Diego on Eastgate Mall for Tanabe Pharmaceuticals. This was a company that um, wanted a, a, a toehold in the U.S., Japanese company. Uh, they had a relationship with the general contractor, Takanaka, that went back to the 1600s. And it was interesting in that through the whole construction process, there were no change orders. I think if the contractor went to the to the owner with the change order, he's expected to commit seppuku or something on the spot, you know, to save face. But it turned into a, a jewel box of a building. It has a central courtyard with a bamboo garden, uh, very zen, very um, oriental, very Asian, very calming. And the building sort of goes around that in a geometric form. It's a triangle, which some people find satisfying as well. So, and there we had one wing of chemistry, one wing, wing of biology, and also with interstitial walkways uh, above them. So we've got uh, number one, uh, Okinawa. Number two is Pfizer. And number right. three is this beautiful little building in UTC or University yes. Town Center there in uh, San Diego. Uh, I grew up in San Diego, so I happen to know uh, exactly where, where that is. And, and I've had the opportunity to look at some of these documents from Okinawa, Mike. You've shared those with me. Uh, when we when we think about that project in in particular, and and we'll share some of these photos and designs with with our listeners and our viewers, but when we think about that project, was there something that that was just overwhelmingly challenging that you thought we weren't going to break through, but we did? Because well, when we think about our careers, it happens all the time, right? And yeah. and we hit those points. Did you hit some yeah. with Okinawa? Oh, absolutely. There are two things. One is the sensitivity, the fragility of the site. And the beauty of the site. Uh, I've teased the people there saying that, you know, this campus doesn't work out and it, it has been spectacularly successful. Uh, if it doesn't work out, they can turn to a Club Med. There's beautiful white sand beaches, turquoise seas, uh, absolutely unspoiled jungle there, but it was sensitive. So what, and I, I think I, I was the initial uh, um, idea for this thing. I proposed the main entry be a tunnel that went under the, under the mountain to a central elevator core so people coming in didn't have to go up the zigzag road up the slope to get to the building on the top of the hill. But they went through this tunnel, and the tunnel is actually walled with display screens. So as they walk through this tunnel, it's probably close to a third of a mile, half a mile long. They'll see displays of what's happening in, in the research program, what's coming down, seminars coming up, what's on the menu in the cafeteria that night. To the central core, again, it's a good place for interaction. They rise up to the middle of the, middle of the campus where this beautiful courtyard with the water feature and all that good stuff. Um, the second thing, um, as I say, was um, the LEED certification, uh, again, done retroactively. And, <clears throat> excuse me, thirdly is working with two other firms, because whenever I work overseas, we've always worked with a local architect. In this case, we had Nick and Seke out of Tokyo, which is a firm close to HOKs in size, and Kuniken, who were out of owner in um, Okinawa, um, well, they did the, the, the outside aesthetic, so to say. Very, very Japanese in style. It's a beautiful, natural building. But if you look at the plan, which I'm sure we'll, we'll share, um, <laughs> it looks almost like a goldfish. It's, it's a very organic shape, anything but rectilinear, which, I mean, you go to most labs around here, they, they're shoeboxes with labs, because labs tend to be lined up in rows of benches, etc. The challenge there was fitting functional labs into these shapes that were like fish or segments of an orange, curvilinear shapes. And we, we overcame that. I think the labs came out absolutely beautiful. In fact, they're attracting people from all over the world. The other interesting thing with that campus is the fact that it's multidisciplinary. There are no departmental boundaries. Various research functions grow and shrink as needed. And you'll have people sitting next to each other from different disciplines, hopefully talking to each other. They also have a beautiful um, central cafeteria, the big courtyard I mentioned, 
where people can meet when they're not actually working, again, to foster interaction and creativity. It sounds like a, an absolutely beautiful campus, and it was designed and inspired in a way that creates and promotes human interaction uh, so that people are developing the best products, services, uh, pharmaceuticals, et cetera, that, that the world needs to, uh, to, to continue on in a way um, that inspires uh, humanity and, and continues to push us all forward. Uh, and I think, I think that's a beautiful way of, of looking at the world. And the work that you do, Mike, is meaningful and important because you're inspiring the minds of, of these great scientists. And uh, certainly for that, uh, I thank you and we thank you for the great work uh, that you have done over a very uh, long and historic and proud career uh, in the architecture space. I'm, I'm glad you didn't become a doctor uh, and, uh, and, and cho chose this path. Uh, so that we can all enjoy these beautiful buildings and spaces that you've created over over a couple of decades. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And and for you out there, if you're looking to get in touch with Mike Mulvey, um, there's probably a couple of ways to do it. Mike, how would somebody get in touch with you uh, if they wanted to connect? The best way is probably through LinkedIn. Um, search me by my name. Uh, I've got a pretty active profile there. Other than that, you can look up HED.design um, for the, co the company. And I think that's probably the, the best. LinkedIn, I would recommend as, as the primary one. Yep. So connect with Mike Mulvey. We'll put that in the show notes. You can connect with him on LinkedIn. Uh, Mike, great having you on the show. Thank you so very much for sharing your thoughts uh, on design and people and empowerment of others uh, through design. Uh, we are grateful for having you on the show. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for joining the Talent Empowerment Podcast. I hope this conversation has lifted you up and your team so that you can lift up your organizations. Uh, if you're in the life sciences space and you're looking for a fantastic designer, head over to HED.design and find Mike. He'd be happy to have a conversation with you. My friends, let's get back to people and culture together. We'll see you on the next episode.